Hello, this is the luckiest maths teacher in the world. Thank you so much for tuning in to this video on orthogonal matrices. So firstly, we're just going to have a quick review of orthogonality. So recall that two vectors are said to be orthogonal if and only if their dot product is equal to zero. Now we're going to look at orthogonal sets. So that means that each vector in the set is orthogonal to each other vector in the set. Or in other words, if you take any two different vectors from the set, their dot product is always equal to zero. So orthogonal is very close to orthonormal. Orthonormal vectors are just vectors that are orthogonal, but each particular vector has length equal to one. It just makes them easier to work with. And as we were talking about when we were doing eigenvectors, it means if you are performing calculations, they won't get arbitrarily large. So one very desirable property of orthogonal sets is that they are always linearly independent. So if we can find, say, four vectors that are orthogonal to each other or orthonormal to each other, then that means they will form a basis for R4, meaning that there are four entries in each vector. If we find two vectors that are orthogonal to each other and they have two entries, they will form a basis for R2. So let's go ahead and look at an example of an orthogonal set. So let's say I have these three vectors here. Do they form an orthonormal basis for R3? Let's investigate that question. So first I need to check whether they form an orthogonal set. So I need to determine whether if I take any pair of these vectors, their dot product will be zero. So let's start with x1 and x2. So remember, dot product is just multiply the components. 1 times 1, 1 times minus 1, 1 times 0. Okay, so x1 and x2 are orthogonal. Let's try x1 and x3. So 1 times 1 is 1, 1 times 1 is 1, and then I have 1 times minus 2. Again, that equals 0. So at this point, I haven't shown that the set of these three vectors is orthogonal because I still need to check x2 and x3. You can't just skip one. You have to check every possible pair of vectors in the set. So x2 and x3, their dot product is 1 times 1, 1 times minus 1, and 0 times minus 2. I don't need to check the other way. I don't need to check x2 dot x1 because the dot product is commutative. So I have shown that x1, x2, and x3 form an orthogonal set. Therefore, I know without needing to check any further that x1, x2, and x3 will be linearly independent. That was one of the rules on the previous slides. So x1, x2, x3 form an orthogonal basis for R3. Now it turns out they are not orthonormal because the length of each vector is not 1. But I can easily change this. What I can do is scale each vector appropriately so that their length becomes 1. So how I do that is I just divide each of the components, each of the entries in the vector, by the length of that vector. So currently the length of x1 is just the square root of 1 squared plus 1 squared plus 1 squared. So that's obviously more than 1. The length of x2 is the square root of 1 squared plus negative 1 squared, which gives me 2. And the length of x3 is the square root of 1 squared plus 1 squared plus negative 2 squared. So to normalize each vector is easy. I just divide each entry in x1 by square root of 3, each entry in x2 by square root of 2, and each entry in x3 by the square root of 6. And they will become orthonormal vectors. So again, the point of doing this is just if I want to involve them in calculations, it will stop them getting arbitrarily large. So now by adding these scalars on the front of each of the vectors, x1, x2, x3 is now an orthonormal basis for R3. So why is the basis being orthogonal important? So of course, remember 
if we have, as we do here, a basis for R3, that means that any vector in R3 can be written as a linear combination of these three vectors. But what's really cool is that when those three vectors are orthogonal, they don't even have to be orthonormal, we can find the appropriate weights in order to write a vector as the linear combination of these three. I guess I should clarify, when I say we can find it, there's a formula that makes it really, really easily. So let's have a look at that. So let's say I have this vector y, which is clearly in R3, and I want to write it as a linear combination of the three vectors x1, x2, x3. Just for simplicity and to avoid some really annoying numbers in the calculation, I'll write it as a combination of the original orthogonal vectors, not the normalized vectors. So normally to do this, to find the weights, I would have to solve a system of linear equations. So normally I'd have to turn this into a system of linear equations and solve for C1, C2, and C3. Now I know there will be a unique solution, C1, C2, and C3, since X1, X2, and X3 form a basis for R3. But since they are orthogonal, I can use a very simple formula that won't take too much time to calculate. So I can calculate each of the weights, C1, C2, C3, directly using this formula. And it requires nothing more than a dot product calculation on the top and the bottom, something which isn't computationally expensive at all. So let's go ahead and find these weights. So C1 will be the dot product of Y and X1. Again, I'm not going to include the green out the front just for simplicity of calculations. So on top, Y dot X1 will be 7 times 1 minus 1 times 1 minus 3 times 1, which gives 3. And X1 dot X1 is just 1 plus 1 plus 1, which is 3. So that means the first weight there, C1, is equal to 1. Let's find C2. C2 on top will be the dot product of Y with X2. So 7 times 1 minus 1 times minus 1 minus 3 times 0 gives 8. And on the bottom, X2 dot X2 gives me 2. So C2 will be 4. And you can follow the formula again and you'll find that C3 is equal to 2. And that was really easy to find. So because the three vectors were orthogonal and formed an orthogonal basis, it's really easy to write any vector in R3 as a linear combination of these three vectors. Normally, we would have to solve a system of linear equations to find the weights that we need in order to write any vector as a linear combination of these three vectors, but the fact that they're orthogonal makes this really, really easy. All right, let's now look at orthogonal matrices. So a matrix is called orthogonal if it's square and its columns form an orthonormal set. So note the sort of discrepancy in terminology here. We call the matrix orthogonal, but its columns are not just orthogonal, they have to be orthonormal. So view each different column of the matrix as its own vector. And each of those columns, each of those vectors is orthogonal to each other one. And each column has length one. If something interesting happens when we multiply an orthogonal matrix by its transpose. Let's have a look at this. Let's consider this matrix here A, which is a three by three matrix. So I'm going to show you why... What I'm about to show you works for three by three matrices, but this is generalizable to square matrices of any size. So instead of writing it like this, let's call A, A1, A2, and A3, where A1, A2, and A3 are the columns of A. So what would A transpose look like? So this is what A transpose would look like. Remember, I just swap the columns and the rows. So what I could do is write A transpose as its rows. So this first row would be A1, the column A1 transpose, and then I'd have A2 transpose and A3 
transpose, okay? So what happens when I multiply together A and A transpose? So A transpose A will be another 3 by 3 matrix. So remember the definition of matrix multiplication. It's the dot product of each row in the first matrix, A transpose, with the columns in the second matrix, which is A. So the entry that goes in row 1, column 1 is row 1, dot product, column 1. And remember, of course, the dot product is commutative. So then which entry goes in row 1, column 2? So it's row 1 of the first matrix, dot column 2 of the second, and so on for all nine elements in this matrix. So this would be the matrix that we end up with. But the thing is that A1... A2 and A3, they are all orthogonal to each other. So remember the dot product XY can be written as X transpose Y and you just end up with a scalar. That's if X and Y are column vectors. So A1 transpose dot A2, for example, that is the dot product of column A1 and column A2, but their dot product must be zero because I said the matrix A was orthogonal, meaning its columns are orthonormal to each other. And similarly, A2 transpose dot say A3 would be zero. So each time we have a different number here, the dot product would be zero. So all of these entries here would end up being zeros. Now, this is why it's important that the columns were orthonormal. If they're orthonormal, that means their length is 1. So that the dot product of a vector and itself is just the square of the length of that vector. But if the length of that vector is 1, the square of its length will be 1. So this entry here, for example, A transpose 1 dot A1, that's just the dot product of this vector with itself, which is just the square of its length, and its length is 1, because A is, has orthonormal columns, so that means this entry here would be 1. Similarly, this one would be 1. The dot product of column vector A2 in itself would be 1, and similarly for A3. So it turns out that A transpose A equals the identity matrix. And that's no coincidence. It turns out if A is an orthogonal matrix, then its transpose is its inverse. In other words, when you multiply an orthogonal matrix by its transpose, you always get the identity matrix. So remember, when you're multiplying matrices and their inverses, it's commutative. So that means that if A is orthogonal, A transpose A is equal to A times A transpose, which is equal to I. So remember, A has to be a square matrix and its columns orthonormal. There are some very interesting properties of orthonormal matrices. It turns out that they preserve the dot product. So that means that if you apply the linear transformation induced by A, an orthogonal matrix, to two vectors, their dot product will be the same after the linear transformation as it was before the linear transformation. Another important property of orthogonal matrices is that they preserve length. If you apply the linear transformation A to a vector, the length of the vector doesn't change under this linear transformation. Another important property that you've probably picked up is, of course, an orthogonal matrix is necessarily invertible. We know this because its columns will be linearly independent, but also because its inverse is its transpose. 
Also, if you multiply together two orthogonal matrices, the result is another orthogonal matrix. So we're going to look at these properties in the lesson. I hope you've enjoyed this video. This has been the luckiest maths teacher in the world. Have a great day.